Okay, I'm recording this for anybody who is not available to show up to the Zoom lecture today. So this will be on my YouTube channel shortly. Later tonight, I'll put it on there. Uh, okay, so we're talking about the Aztec Empire and its capital at Tenochtitlan. We talked about the difference between Mexica and Aztec, um, that the Mexica is one of three ethnic groups that joins together um, with the Acolwas and the Tepanex to form this triple alliance that then becomes the foundation of the Aztec Empire. Um, and of course, as I just mentioned, the place glyph of Tenochtitlan is this rock with the cactus, the flowering cactus growing out of it. And Tenochtitlan literally translates to the place where there is an abundance of um, prickly pear cactus or the cactus that produces tuna, where there's an abundance of these growing out of a rocky spot, right? So this is the, the place glyph for Tenochtitlan, which becomes the capital of the Aztec Empire. So if you're looking at this image here, you're seeing the map um, of this Aztec capital, the capital of the empire. Um, you'll see um, several lakes uh, around uh, a small island. This small island is where Tenochtitlan originally was built. Um, and you can see Tlacopan and Tashcoco here on the other side. Um, and so these are the three cities that band together to form this triple alliance. In this big lake, Lake, lake Tashcoco, which is a really interesting lake because it has some um, fresh water, as most lakes do, but it also has um, brackish water, kind of like salty water. Um, so it's a very unusual sort of um, environment. Uh, and it, because of this, um, it's a very unique ecosystem in the world. Like there are specific plants and animals that like only grow here, like then don't grow anywhere else in the entire world um, because of this unique ecosystem. Anyway, all of these lakes that you're looking at, um, with the exception um, of Lake Xochimilco, which you see down in the south, um, are pretty much non-existent. So what happens is like that the indigenous people um, adapt to the rise and fall of the level of the lake. Um, basically, when there are heavy rains, you know, the level of the lake rises and then it falls back down depending on the season. Um, the Spaniards found this very inconvenient um, and decided to drain all of these lakes. Uh, and so built their city on top of what is basically really unstable marshland. So all this area around this island, like this is modern day Mexico City and modern yeah. day Mexico City really is built on unstable land. Um, so if anybody has been to Mexico City, um, they might have, especially in downtown, um, in the center, they might have seen some kind of like lopsided buildings um, because in fact buildings are like, you know, sinking um, and lopsided at, you know, different rates because the land is unstable there. What still remains is Lake Xochimilco, which is in the south of the city. Um, and you can go there today and visit and you can kind of get a sense of what the city might have looked more like at the time, um, you know, of the arrival of Europeans. Uh, and today that part of the city, like, so, there are these canals and waterways um, and the chinampas, which are these, you know, like built kind of islands. Uh, today, nowadays, like people can go to that part of the city uh, to buy plants for their like landscaping needs. Um, and then also it's like a place um, for like leisure, you know, bourgeois leisure, you know, people can go to Xochimilco, rent a little boat um, and spend Sunday, you know, sort of like drinking and eating and like moving around, like, you know, you hire this guy to like, you know, not row, but like push you off the bottom, kind of like the canals in Venice. Um, but they kind of, you know, take you around um, for a couple of hours and you can kind of enjoy a leisure activity. So this is what like, Lake Xochimilco has like kind of turned into now. Um, but if you go there and look at it, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute, you'll get an idea of like what Tenochtitlan would have looked like. So in the center, you can see the island. And then when you're looking at this map, you see all of this blue stuff around the island. And you see that it says 
Chinampas. The Chinampas are these uh, human-made islands, basically. Um, so people um, would build islands to um, grow agriculture on. So this is how uh, people in the Aztec Empire were able to feed um, their growing population. So here in the city, um, in the capital itself, um, is the ceremonial precinct, um, and then the the island is surrounded by chinampas, and then you can see these lines that connect the island to the mainland, and these are causeways. The causeways um, are kind of like bridges, but they're lower, um, and these connect Tenochtitlan to um, the mainland and the rest of central Mexico. And I think I mentioned this at the start of the lecture, but I want to remind you that um, by 1519, um, we see that the Aztec Empire uh, has come to dominate all of central Mexico, um, except for one state, one state, which is Tlaxcala. Um, so you'll see Tenochtitlan here where this red dot is. Um, so this is the capital area. This is the capital and this is like kind of the capital state. And then all of these other areas that are shaded in are the areas that had been um, conquered and absorbed into the empire. So that means that like, you know, Mixtec people living in the modern day state of Oaxaca, um, they were still Mixtec people, but they had been they had become part of the Aztec Empire and they had to pay their taxes. And taxes came in the form of tribute. So um, the capital might say, uh, you know, oh, you Mixtecs are really great at working with gold um, and um, with working, uh, working with turquoise. So you have to send us, you know, like, I don't know, 50 skulls covered in turquoise um, and, you know, 200, like, you know, pieces of gold jewelry every year. So as these, these parts of Mesoamerica were conquered, um, the Aztec, which is like, you know, a pretty typical function of an empire, um, they said, you know, people can keep living how they want to live. Like you, you're, you're Mishtec people, you can keep speaking Mishtec language. You can keep making Mishtec art, just pay your taxes every year, right? So in many ways, kind of life went on for people. Um, they just suddenly had these new taxes to pay to the empire. And um, I don't know, people don't like paying taxes, I guess. <laughs> so when Spaniards arrived, um, they were able to take advantage of the fact that people didn't like being conquered by the Aztec capital, by the Mexica. Um, and they also took advantage of the fact that Tlaxcala refused to be conquered. Tlaxcala is right next to the core, you know, center of the empire. And they always fought back. They always, always fought back. And when the Spaniards got there, the Spaniards only had 300 men. Um, you have hundreds of thousands of people um, in the Aztec Empire. And so the Spaniards took advantage of this and they um, allied themselves with the Tlaxcalans and they needed the Tlaxcalans. They used the Tlaxcalans to help them um, overthrow the Aztec Empire. Okay, um, so um, I want to review a few things before we actually look at the art. Um, and I want to uh, review a few of the deities in the Aztec pantheon. Some of them you're already familiar with. Everybody knows Tlaloc, right? Yeah, who's Tlaloc? Tlaloc is the water god! <laughs> Thank you. Tlaloc is the water god, yes. Uh, I am recording. Why does somebody say, I thought you were recording? I am recording. Uh, okay. Uh, Marissa, somebody wants you to sing that again. <laughs> Tlaloc is the water god. <laughs> okay. Tlaloc is the water god, the rain deity. And of course, you all know Quetzalcoatl, right? Quetzal, remember, means feather, and coat, coatl means snake, so feathered serpent, right? So this is the feathered serpent deity, a deity associated with wind and kind of like a general life force. So these deities you're already familiar with, and these seem to be pan-Mesoamerican deities. So that means that like in other parts of Mesoamerica, throughout time, like not just in this moment that we're in, um, but historically, 
there seemed to have been oh, some kind of water deity and some kind of feathered serpent deity. And we saw these at Toltec Maya sites like Chichen Itza, Toltec sites like Tula, um, the Teotihuacan site, Teotihuacan, right? So we've seen these deities before. Um, we've seen Chuck, um, the rain god in the Maya region. So these are not unfamiliar terms. Um, some of these other deities might be less familiar for you. And I want to highlight three. Um, don't worry about Tezcatlipoca and Tonatiu, although they're great. Tezcatlipoca is my personal favorite because he's a <laughs> trickster. Um, so if you're into tricksters and sorcerers, you can do a little more research on Tezcatlipoca. Um, but he's always like, I mean, I'm pretty sure he's a Scorpio. Like he's always getting people, <laughs> he's always like, you know, secretly stirring up um, drama and then just watching things fall apart. It's kind of a funny- You steal your wife. <laughs> love that let's assign like all the gods like different zodiac signs like you're such a pisces <laughs> that's a, that's, Tlaloc is a pisces <laughs> Tlaloc is a pisces or maybe cancer definitely like some somebody very weepy right <laughs> um okay so but the three that i want to highlight are Kotlikwe uh and Kotlikwe and you'll recognize Koat from Quetzalcoatl so you see you'll recognize that word snake um and her name literally means um, snakes her skirt or snaky skirt lady. Uh, she is a primordial earth goddess and a mother goddess. She is the mother of the next two names that you see on the screen, which I know there's a lot of, you know, Z's and X's in these words, but I want you to learn how to say them. Um, the first one is Koyo Shalki. Koyo Shalki, lady bells her cheeks, or the lady with the bells on her cheeks, um, is considered under a sort of like official Aztec dogma, I guess, um, this kind of traitor or enemy of the empire because um, she sets herself up as the enemy of her brother, Huitzilopochtli. Huitzilopochtli, his name means hummingbird left, hummingbird left. Um, he is the main Mexica tribal deity. So the Mexica people are a tribe before they build an empire, before they build the Aztec empire. Um, and they're a wandering tribe. Um, and their main deity is Huitzilopochtli, who happens to be a god of war. So these are the three that I really want you to know. Coatlicue, Coyoshauki, and Huitzilopochtli. Uh, and I'll show you some images of them so you can see how they're depicted in Aztec art. Tlaloc you're already familiar with, um, a rain deity, probably a Pisces. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you'll see Tlaloc um, in the codices, uh, and in um, 2D and 3D art throughout Mesoamerica, often depicted with this kind of um, circular eye, this squiggly thing that I call the hipster mustache, um, and some fangs that hang down. Um, in this case, this appears to be, you know, like somebody dressed up as Tlaloc, perhaps. Um, and of course, um, uh, he's often depicted or associated with water. So here would be Tlaloc, perhaps um, on the right side here, um, a priest dressed up as Tlaloc. Um, and then you can see that Tlaloc is sort of like sitting on this giant hill and like all of this water is gushing out of it. And you can see at the ends of the streams of the water, little shells and what look like sand dollars, um, sort of, you know, reiterating that this is water. Um, and here you see, so in this image, this is a colonial image. So this image was produced after Europeans arrived. And I think you can see by looking at it, the influence of European art styles. You can see the way the body is depicted um, is much more a European style. The figure is elongated and not so abstracted. Um, we can really tell here that this is a human dressed up in a costume wearing a Tlaloc mask with that round eye, that squiggly mustache, and these fangs that hang down. Um, in this case, the priest is holding um, a bolt of lightning, right? So lightning, rain, thunderstorms, all of these would be associated with Tlaloc. Um, you can see, so we think that this image is um, made by an indigenous artist who had been exposed to European art. Um, so you can see again some of those European influences. You can see like 
not only like the way the body is depicted in this sort of like, you know, um, more anatomically um, associated with like the way humans look um, more naturalistic, but also you can see like, look at the bottom of the feet and there's like a little shadow. Can you see the little, the shading under the feet? Uh -huh. um, so that's like that kind of um, three dimensionality is something that's more associated with European art. Uh, of course, Mesoamerican art is much more abstracted in comparison to European art. So this is just to give you an idea of what Tlaloc looks like in um, art, in Mesoamerican art. And of course, we all know Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent deity, um, this life god, a god associated with wind um, and sort of the, for the energy and force of life. Um, and we've seen this um, deity depicted in two-dimensional art and in sculpture, um, usually depicted with these kind of feathers. Um, in this case, this really looks like a snake's head um, and then kind of feathers coming out around as if it were a crown. Oh, hold on one second. I'm going to close um, my window because the gardeners are outside. Tetzatlipoca, um, you can look up. Um, he's an interesting trickster, mischievous deity who is also an oracle and sorcerer. Um, and um, you can look up some of these other deities, but I want you to look now at Coatlicue. Hold on. Sorry, gardener time. Um, okay, so Kotlikwe, uh, <laughs> intermission over. Somebody wants to know where they can find this recording. I will post it on um, YouTube later. Okay, so Kotlikwe is the lady snakes her skirt. So she's got a skirt made out of snakes. She's this um, creative goddess and earth goddess. Uh, and she's the mother of Huitzilopochtli. And so because she's the mother of Huitzilopochtli, and you remember Huitzilopochtli, the main Mexica tribal deity, um, she's sort of like, you know, the mother of all the gods. Um, so um, there's this really important story from um, Mexica mythology that I'll need to tell you um, so that you can understand Coatlicue, um, Huitzilopochtli, and Coyoshalki. Um, here's an, I'll tell you it momentarily. On the left, you see, I don't know if my left and your left is the same. On your left, you see a sculpture. Yeah, that's still the left. Yeah, so it's not mirrored. Okay, great. So on the left, um, you'll see a sculpture, a stone sculpture. Um, this is a sculpture of Coatlicue. In the place of her head, you can see the in profile, um, two snakes. Um, and it, then you see a bare chest and on her chest, covering her chest is a necklace made out of human hearts and hands. And she's wearing a pretty scary looking belt buckle that has a skull. Um, so this is the belt buckle uh, of her belt that looks to be like it's made out of a snake. Um, and then she's wearing a skirt that's a whole bunch of twisting snakes. Um, and then her hands are kind of like these claws and her face also, uh, her feet also have sharp claws on them. I love her. Yes, she's very powerful. She's very uh, intimidating. So this sculpture is like, um, I don't know, nine feet tall. It's like a huge, huge sculpture. So the idea is when you see this sculpture, like you should be like a little bit afraid, kind of like you're afraid of your mom with her chunkla. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> really, really hit me with that one. <laughs> that, that's how afraid you're supposed to be of Coatlicue. Uh, on the right, um, you'll see uh, a European depiction. So a colonial depiction, not European, but colonial anyway. Um, depiction of Coatlicue. So you can see the European influence. You can see the way um, the body is depicted uh, is sort of more naturalistic and more aligned with European standards and less abstracted. 
Aztec art is very abstract um, and colonial art showing this European influence um, is more naturalistic, but you still see um, a, a woman who's wearing a skirt made out of snakes. So then you can know that it's Coatlicue, snaky skirt lady. This is Coatlicue, um, and here is the, uh, a, a similar sculpture. So there are actually multiples of these Coatlicue statues um, that have been found um, in and around Mexico City. This is a photograph from the National Museum of Anthropology, which I hope to take some students to someday um, when we're allowed to travel again, um, hopefully we can do a little study abroad to Mexico City and you can go see this in person. Um, the um, Anthropology Museum in Mexico City is like literally one of the best in the entire world. Uh, so you can see the sculpture here. Um, you can see um, this person standing right here and it gives you a sense of how large this is. It's like a really large imposing sculpture and it's meant to sort of scare you. Um, so she's a mother goddess, she's a, a mother deity, but she's also powerful. Um, so, you know, there's a reverence um, and respect, but also an element of fear, right? The other uh, deity that I want you to know about is Koyoshalki. Koyoshalki, her name translates to bells her cheeks. So um, she has bells on her cheeks right here. Um, and you'll see her depicted like this in sculpture with bells on her cheeks. And in this sculpture right here that you're looking at, these are the bells on her cheeks. Um, she is the daughter of Coatlicue uh, and the brother or the sister of Huitzilopochtli. So her brother is Huitzilopochtli. Um, she is considered a traitor of the Aztec state because she, along with her 400 brothers, um, they take on their mom um, and try to kill her. And Huitzilopochtli, you know, defends um, his mother and himself. Uh, and there, the story, this story that I'm about to tell you um, is the myth that kind of explains um, the existence of the Milky Way um, and the stars and the moon. So Quil Shalki is a moon goddess, a goddess associated with the moon. Uh, and uh, the last deity that I want you to know about is Huitzilopochtli, um, the main Mexica tribal deity, the war deity. So he's the god of war. Uh, and he is linked to like the number one purpose of the Aztec empire, which is to build an empire through war, right? So go out and conquer, go out and conquer. And this is really what um, Huitzilopochtli tells the Mexica people that they need to do, right? You need to go out and conquer in my name, right? So the, the number one God of the Aztec empire is a war deity. Somebody asked me if this is the one that I got tattooed. Uh, oh, um, yes, this is Coil Shalki. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> this is Coil Shalki. Lady Bells Her Cheeks. Um, and you'll notice in the tattoo that um, she's all chopped up. Her arms and legs have been chopped up, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, so Huitzilopochtli is this war deity. Um, he, he's linking the, the purpose of the Aztec Empire to conquest and expansion. Um, and because of this, because he's this war deity, he demands human sacrifice through violence, right? Um, so um, these are the three main deities uh, that I want you to know about. Um, and now I will tell you um, the story about them. Oh, um, one thing that you should be able to recognize Huitzilopochtli. Um, and how can you recognize him? Because he wears a hummingbird helmet or headdress. Um, so here you can see the hummingbird face and you can see the little beak of the hummingbird. Um, again, here he is. So he's usually dressed for battle. So he usually has like some kind of weapon in his hand, some kind of uh, shield, like a battle attire. And then he's got this headdress um, or helmet or hat that looks like a hummingbird. And you've seen hummingbirds. They have this really long beak, right? Um, so you can see that um, long pointy beak right here. So this is, this is Huitzilopochtli. 
Uh, and um, I just want to show you, because I was showing you earlier, um, Coatlicue, like the Aztec version and then the European um, version. So on, on your left, you have um, an abstracted sort of um, depiction of Huitzilopochtli that's more aligned with um, how an indigenous artist would depict Huitzilopochtli. Um, so dressed in, um, you know, his war attire and with his hummingbird headdress. On your right, you see a European depiction of Huitzilopochtli um, that he just sort of generally looks like a European idea of a monster and it's not really based on like what Huitzilopochtli actually looked like, um, you know, according to uh, indigenous, the indigenous population. So Europeans are basing their ideas like on their own concepts of sort of like um, evil, evil spirits or evil monsters. Um, so this really looks nothing like, you know, what indigenous people would have said Huitzilopochtli looked like. So you can see that different perspective. Um, okay, so what do I want to tell you? Um, I, do, I do a whole thing about fire and water um, that you should read about, um, but I'm not gonna take time to talk about it today, but just read it there in the slideshow. Uh, so I wanna actually tell you the story of, I wanna tell you the story of Huitzilopochtli um, and Coatlicue, and then I'm gonna go back and talk about some of these other things. Um, Let me just skip forward in the slideshow to, oh, here we go. Okay, this is the image that I wanna show you. So I wanna tell you this origin myth. Um, this is really the story of the birth of Huitzilopochtli. Um, so this is a story that's recorded in the late 16th century in a really important book that I've mentioned to you before, The General History of the Things of New Spain, right? Um, and this book has another name that we call it the Florentine Codex. Um, it's written and compiled by a Franciscan friar, Bernardino de Sahagún, who, when he arrives, so he's a European, when he arrives, um, you know, he's, he, he's, he's thinking, oh, maybe like, instead of just like killing all the indigenous people, I could learn to speak Nahuatl and I could talk to them. Um, so he learns to speak Nahuatl and interviews Aztec elders. So this is the end of the 16th century. So after the um, conquest uh, and he interviews Aztec elders and he says, tell me about, tell me about your religious beliefs. Tell me about the people who were there before you. Um, and these Aztec elders told him their, their stories, their histories, their oral tradition. This is where we get the term um, Olmeca, right? Um, so these are Aztec elders who are telling Sagun, oh, the first people who lived here were the Olmec people, right? Um, and so he writes down all of this information in Spanish and he writes it also in Nahuatl. And then, so this is like kind of a, the Rosetta Stone um, for Nahuatl Spanish translation. Um, and then he has indigenous artists um, illustrate it. So the image that you're looking at um, on the right here is an illustration from the Florentine Codex, the general history of the things of New Spain. Uh, and you see an illustration of the story of um, Huitzilopochtli, uh, Coatlicue, and Coyoshalki. So what's the story? Basically, um, <laughs> Coatlicue, Lady Snakey Skirt, um, is on Snake Mountain, Snake Mountain, um, and she's hanging out and she's sweeping. Uh, and while she's sweeping on Snake Mountain, a feather comes and la lands um, on her chest and like falls down her blouse and impregnates her. That's how it happens sometimes, you know, immaculate conception or something. So she gets pregnant, she gets impregnated by this feather. Um, and then uh, who knows how, how she gets impregnated by a feather. But anyway, she gets impregnated by this feather um, and then what happens, um, her daughter, Coil Schalke, who is um, Lady Bell's her cheeks. And I'm gonna go back to the image of 
Coil Shalky, so you can see. Coil Shalky comes with her 400 brothers um, to attack her mother. Now, it's not really clear why Coil Shalky is supposed to be upset, but she's supposed to be upset. Um, and she wants to prevent the birth of her brother, Huitzilopochtli. So she attacks the mother um, along with her 400 brothers. So they attack their mom, Coatlicue. And Coatlicue is pregnant with Huitzilopochtli, the war god. Huitzilopochtli like leaps out of her womb, you know, like alien style. Like, leaps? <laughs> yeah, like, like bust open, like bust through. Bust through. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like full on alien style like breaks out of her stomach and like jumps out um and and he's like fully grown he's like 18 and buff and dressed for warfare so he's like born grown um he's born age 18 and super buff and like ready for warfare he leaps out of her womb um and tries to defend his mother and fights his 400 brothers and his sister, Coil Shalki. Um, and he chops off her head and he throws her body down Snake Mountain. And as her body is rolling down Snake Mountain, um, it's dismembered. So the arms break off and the legs break off as it's tumbling down Snake Mountain. Um, and it lands on the bottom. Um, and he defeats his 400 brothers and his sister, Coil Shalki. And he's like, mom, I got you. I protected you. I killed my 400 brothers um, and my sister, Coil Shalki. And his mother, um, as any mother would be, is distraught. She's like, you killed all my babies. Like, what will I do without my babies? And he's like, don't worry, mom, I got you. Um, I, got, I got a solution. Um, and he takes um, you know, the 400 brothers, um, I don't know, I guess their bodies, and um, throws them into the sky. Um, and he takes the head of Coil Shalki and throws it up into the sky. And he makes the moon, he makes the Milky Way galaxy, I guess. Um, he makes the moon and the stars. Um, and he's like, Mom, you can look up into the sky every night. And you can see your daughter, Coil Shalki, in the moon um, and all your sons um, in all of the stars of the Milky Way galaxy, something like this. So, you know, um, every version of the story has um, different details, um, but this is the, the general story, um, this creation myth of you know, Huitzilopochtli is this war god. He's born out of violence. Um, and immediately upon his birth, he engages in an act of warfare, right? Um, fighting all of his brothers at Snake Mountain. And he wins. He defeats them all and kills all of his 400 brothers and his sister, Coil Shalki. This is the great foundational myth of the Aztec Empire. This is the story of the birth of the main Mexica deity, right? So this is like a very violent beginning to the story. Um, and so it makes sense then that once the Mexica people do set up an empire, that they um, grow and enforce their empire through violence, right? Um, because this is the origin story of their main deity. Now, there is um, a modern contemporary feminist rereading of the story um, in which uh, basically in the like Chicana feminist rereading of the story of Quail Shalki, um, instead of Quail Shalki being so like by all accounts, so by the like traditional accounts, like Quail Shalki is a traitor. She's an enemy of, of Huitzilopochtli, right? Like she represents somebody standing up to the Aztec empire, right? And so she's used um, as this kind of model of like how you shouldn't behave if you're a good citizen of the empire, um, that you should not stand up to your brother. Um, but in the Chicana feminist rereading, um, and this is, so this is a reinterpretation. This is how Chicana feminists said, well, maybe in the story actually, instead of being a traitor, um, she's the hero of the story. She's a pacifist martyr. Um, so how does this work? In this version of the story, Quail Shalki knew that Huitzilopochtli's birth would usher in a period of warfare, um, violence, and imperialism. And she seeks to stop that and prevent that period of warfare, violence, and imperialism from coming um, by, you know, trying to kill her, prevent her brother from being born. Um, and in doing so, she ends up becoming this martyr 
Um, she's killed by her brother um, and becomes this kind of symbol or martyr for um, standing up to her brother, standing up to machismo, standing up to violence, standing up to imperialism. And of course, we know that what happens, um, you know, once the Mexica start building an empire, they usher in a period of violence and imperialism. So this is a modern or contemporary kind of Chicana feminist rereading uh, of the story. Um, okay, so those are the three main deities that I want you to know. Coatlicue, Huitzilopochtli, and Coyoshanque. Do you have any questions so far? No. Anybody else? No questions? Okay. So, no. Um, the next thing, um, you know, I don't know what time it is. Um, 1.40. Oh, okay. So I still have a little bit of time because I want to actually talk about art. Um, so um, I'm going to move forward a little bit because I want to look at the art some more more closely. Um, so the, that's one that's like a, a major origin story uh, in terms of, you know, like the mythology of the Aztec Empire. So that's like a really important story to know because it helps you understand um, what comes next. Um, what comes next? The, as I mentioned earlier, the Mexica are uh, a tribe, uh, a, a, a group of people who are uh, living a semi-nomadic lifestyle. Um, and there are different origin stories for like where the Mexica people come from. Um, so in different versions, there are different names for the places. Um, so this image that you're seeing on your screen right now is from the Historia Tolteca Chichimeca. These are all colonial sources. So there are documents that are written in the colonial period. So you have to take everything that's said with a grain of salt. Um, but in this version of the story, um, people leave from the place of seven caves. So here you can see these kind of like round um, structures that might um, remind you of the hills that we saw, the glyphs for hills. So they're on the interior of a hill. Um, and you can see these heads that stand in for the different tribes. And then you see footprints. Um, and so in this kind of origin story, people leave from the place of seven caves. Is this a story of like humanity, like progressing from caves? Maybe, yes, right? Um, we know that people came to, um, you know about Pangea, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Pangea. Pangea? Yeah, what's Pangea? I don't know if this microphone works. Does it work? Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Uh, well, Pangea is supposed to be the origin of the earth, right? Like, uh, well, when the one earth was all one continent. Yes. A supercontinent. Super yes. When the continents were stuck together on this supercontinent, right? Um, so the theory is that people have migrated to different parts of the world um, and then and then the continents spread apart, right? So like people in the Americas probably came over at some point historically from Asia, right? So people came out of Africa um, across um, through Asia and then like across, um, what do you call that? The Bering Strait, right? And down like where Alaska is and down the coast, right? So this is gen the general, generally accepted theory, right? Um, that this is how uh, people migrated. So is this, is the place of the seven caves, is the story, the Historia Toteca Chichimeca, like a story of like human migration? Maybe yes, like just like when I think about the stories about like the feathered serpent, I swear like I think that's about dinosaurs, you know? Um, but anyway, so in, anyway, people leave from this place and start moving south. Um, and this is what um, the Mexica people do. They leave and they migrate and they start kind of, um, they're kind of typif like, typically characterized as a, a wandering tribe. Um, so why, what does that mean? They're not really settling down in one place. They're not really building structures. They're kind of going around and um, they get into fights with people wherever they go. Um, and, you know, sometimes they win their battles and like take loot with them, kind of like Vikings, right? You know how Vikings are known for like going around and like looting 
you can kind of think of the Mexica, the early Mexica as this, like similar, like a, um, yeah, they want to see the world. <laughs> They want to see the world. They want to travel, um, but they do start fights wherever they go. Um, this is kind of the stereotype. Anyway, um, they leave the place of seven caves. Um, they're migrating, wandering from their origin place, which is vaguely in the north, which is why um, people in the modern period talk about this idea of Aslan being like, the place that the Mexica came from being in the north so like it could be where we are right now right like the ground underneath us could be like some kind of you know origin place um, for, for where the Mexica people came from and as they're going along their journey wandering south they get a mandate from Huitzilopochtli. So Huitzilopochtli appears to them. Here's another image of the Mexica people coming out of the cave. In this instance, you could see the cave sort of, I don't know, looks like a bear kind of monster. Um, so they're coming out of the cave um, and wandering north, or wandering south. Um, and they get a mandate from Huitzilopochtli. And Huitzilopochtli basically says, I want you to go to the place where you see uh, the eagle landing on the cactus. The cactus is growing out of a, out of like a rocky place. Um, and there, I want you to conquer all the tribes that you meet um, and with your shields and with your arrows, go out and conquer and build the empire. So this, is, this is the divine mandate that their, their God is telling them what to do, right? Um, so this is literally what they do. This is literally what they do. Yeah, that's the center of like uh, Mexico City, right? Because they were like looking. Um, I don't forget who told them, but pretty much like if they found an eagle on top of a cactus and eating a snake at the same time, they were like, sorry, right there, the city, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's this the is point. what Huitzilopochtli tells them. You know, when you see that, that's where you're going to settle down. Like, I know you're wandering right now, but when you see that eagle on that cactus, that's where you're going to build your city. The Spanish um, people paint this or huh? Or were the Spanish people like paint this picture or was it um the Aztecs? This is a colonial document. Okay. Colonial. Um yeah, so um in the um indigenous glyphs you'll see the cactus growing out of the rock, so the one that I showed you earlier. This one with the eagle with the snake in its mouth is from the colonial period. Um so some versions of the story have the snake, some versions don't. But you will recognize this image. Um, here you see the eagle with the snake in its mouth landing on the flowering cactus that's growing out of the rock. Um, and of course, you will recognize um, this image the in flag, yeah. the Mexican flag. So here's a close up. And again, you see the eagle in this instance with a snake in the mouth. Now I'll tell you, most of the um, early sources don't involve the snake. I think the snake is something that came in a little bit later. Um, but anyway, the eagle with the snake landing on the cactus. And can you see that's a flowering cactus? So it's got these, you know, fruits on it. And then do you see the rock? And look at the rock. What's it in? Lake. Water, yeah, oh, okay. water. That's the glyph for water, and that's Lake Texcoco, mm -hmm. right? So this is literally on the Mexican flag, the place glyph of Tenochtitlan. In case you didn't know, did your minds explode? Damn, it did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is like, you know, this. It's kind of a big deal. It's, there's an indigenous glyph on the Mexican flag, you know, and this is something that actually we'll talk about later when we get to the time period when we talk about like Mexican independence and how Mexican uh, identity is differentiated from Spanish identity when Mexico yeah. <laughs> is independent from Spain. 
Yeah. When Mexico becomes independent from Spain, Mexico needs to define themselves like how are we different from the Spaniards? And the one thing that we see um, is an emphasis on the indigenous heritage of Mexico as like the differentiating mm -hmm. factor. And we'll talk about this more when we get to the unit on like nationalism and Mexican national identity. Um, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, let's go back to um, look at one more one more depiction of this migration story so i want you to understand that um, there are many different versions of the story and the details are different in every version but the main idea is the same in every version of the mexica migration huitzilopochtli tells the people to go and build a city and then to conquer so in this version, this is from the Codex Boterini. So all the different codices have different versions of the story. In this version, you can see that there are seven houses instead of seven caves. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then there's this large one in the center. So in this version of the story, seven houses, seven groups of people. Um, and you can see that this individual is leaving on a boat. So leaving from an island um, in this case. So leaving on a boat, um, heading um, in this case across um, on, on water on a canoe, and then you see footprints, which you'll remember indicate travel, footprints indicate travel. Um, and then you'll see again, something that you recognize, this glyph. Do you recognize this glyph? What is the shape of this glyph? Hill? Yes, that's a hill. That is a hill. That's the glyph for hill or mountain. Um, and then here you'll see something inside of the hill. So that's a cave, right? Yeah, when there's somebody or something inside of a hill or a mountain, that's a cave. And can you, anybody recognize who this is? Let me see if I got a close up. Do you recognize this figure? Is that whistle pushly? Because he has the hummingbird helmet. That yeah. is correct. Yay. That is correct. So you see a head and then you see this hummingbird helmet. That's Wichlopochli. So Wichlopochli is in a cave um, and he's um, shooting candy canes out of the cave. Not really. Do you remember what these these candy cane shaped glyphs are? That's for talking or singing. Correct, talking or singing. So that's a speech scroll. And I have a speech scroll right here. <laughs> speech scroll. Oh. This is a speech scroll. This is the glyph for um, speaking or singing. So Huitzilopochtli is speaking and telling the people again his divine mandate, right? Go where you see the cactus growing out of the rocky place. And there I want you to build your city. And from there, with your shield and with your arrow, go around and conquer everybody. Another interesting, uh, interesting thing I want to point out is this. Can you see this thing right here? What's that? One flint knife? That's correct. <laughs> correct, art historian. One flint. One flint um, is used in the codices um, to mean the beginning of time. So it's not a necessarily an actual date. It's kind of like, do you know um, fairy tales, how they begin? Once upon a time. Once upon, Once upon a, a time. Knife. <laughs> Once upon a flint knife. Once upon a flint knife. So once upon, uh, flint, one flint is kind of like saying once upon a time. So this is the ancient story of the migration um, of the Mexica people. And they're wandering and they're coming across this land and ostensibly coming north from whatever, however far north toward Mexico City. And they're coming across a treacherous landscape that in the rainy season is very wet, in the dry season is very rocky and difficult terrain. Um, and they're moving across um, this terrain of the Valley of Mexico. Um, and they come across this island, this island, which um, at the time um, was basically uninhabited. Nobody lived on it, about 12 square miles. 
Um, and that's where they see, you know, um, the eagle landing on the cactus growing out of this rocky place. And so this is where they decide um, to build their capital on this island. Um, it's a marshy island. Nobody lived there. Um, and they kind of, and then, and it's in like, you know, what could at times be like a difficult landscape. And they kind of like, you know, end up building one of the most amazing cities the world has ever seen, um, you know, out of nothing, right? Um, out of like a marshy, uninhabited island. Um, so the first thing they do is build causeways to the mainland. So you can see that here. And I mentioned that earlier. Um, and we saw that in the map that I showed you. So here's the island. And then they built all of these causeways connecting the island to the mainland. Here is that glyph um, that I mentioned to you earlier. So this is the kind of indigenous method of depicting the glyph of Tenochtitlan. So you have the glyph for rock, the glyph for cactus. You'll see that you've got um, the tuna, the um, pickly prayer, pickly pear, prickly, I can say words, <laughs> prickly pear. That's the prickly pear um, or tuna fruit. Um, and so you see the rock, the cactus, um, and the, the um, term tlan means abundance of. So the place where there is an abundance of nochtli, prickly pear cactuses, growing out of tetl, the um, rock, among the prickly pears, um, growing amongst the rock. So this is the place cliff for Tenochtitlan. Um, and I think I took this photograph actually, like they have these all around Mexico City, like on the sides, um, on outsides of buildings, um, you know, identifying the different places. Um, it's pretty interesting. Um, okay, so they go here um, and you see the place glyph also in this colonial codex, um, the cactus, the rock, and then in this case, um, you also have the eagle. Um, and they begin to conquer all of the people around them. So they start conquering and building their empire. Um, in the meantime, they're also building their capital city with these causeways. So in this photograph, you see a causeway. This is not um, a causeway in Mexico City because all this water is drained. Um, but a causeway is basically like a bridge, but just not raised up. It's kind of like earth and soil that's been compacted um, so you can make a bridge kind of across a body of water but it's not raised up so this is what a causeway is and in fact these causeways um, that you see in this illustration here and then i've shown you on the map um, actually become in modern mexico city like the major roads um, of the city it's kind of like you know like this is Harbor Boulevard or, you know, Orange Thorpe, like these become the major roads or like even almost like the freeways, right? Like here's the 91, here's the 57, right? So these, in modern Mexico City, these become um, roads. Um, okay, so um, they build this really magnificent city. So this is what I wanna look at in the last um, bit of class. I wanna look at the pyramids that they built, um, the sculptures that they use to decorate their pyramids, the temples that they built, um, and all of the art that they produced. In the center was the, the ceremonial precinct. So this was kind of like um, the center of both religious and political power. Um, and then people were living um, sort of outside of these areas. Um, and then you can also see in this illustration all of these little islands um, that were used. Well, these are where people lived and also were used for farmland. So this is how they were able to feed the growing population of the empire. Uh, okay, so this is the ritual center, the ritual, the ceremonial precinct. Uh, and this is an artist's rendering of what it would have looked like. Um, so you can see that the whole area would have been walled off um, and that there would have been a very large temple. This is known now as the Templo Mayor, the Great Temple that um, has two side-by-side um, -side staircases. Um, and at the top, there are two temples on top of this pyramid. 
one dedicated to Tlaloc and the other dedicated to, can you guess? Huitzilopochtli. Huitzilopochtli. That's correct. Huitzilopochtli. Um, flanking the Templo Mayor are um, two temples. Um, these are dedicated to the two main branches of the Aztec military, the Eagle Warriors and the Jaguar Warriors. So the two temples flanking the Great Temple are dedicated to the military. So you can see that um, militarism and religion are very closely tied in the Aztec Empire. There are all sorts of other um, pyramids, temples, structures, altars um, around the ceremonial precinct and where all of these pyramids and structures are today, like right here, this is where the cathedral is. Right here, this is where the National Palace is. Um, so there are literally all these colonial buildings on top of um, these ruins. I want to show you a little video. Can you hear it? By 1324 yes. AD, the Aztecs had finally reached their promised land, an island in the middle of a lake. In this most unlikely of sites, they would somehow build Tenochtitlan, one of the most awesome cities the world had ever seen. But how could a city built on a small island hold a population that would soon swell to a quarter of a million people? Using the simple but ingenious method of pounding stakes into the lake bed, and then lashing them together with reeds, the Aztecs poured in mud and rocks to literally build themselves more land. These are the Chinampas. They expanded their small island into a vast 2,500 acres. Pretty ingenious. When the Spanish conquistadors first saw the Aztec city in 1519, they were amazed. There in the center of the lake was this gleaming white city. It was something they had never seen before. And for us, we could almost imagine as Dorothy looking at the, uh, you know, at Oz for the first time. It was far larger at a quarter of a million people than any city they had ever seen in Europe. By the 1500s, Tenochtitlan was a teeming metropolis. It held twice the population of London or Rome. So it was larger. It was larger Most than London and Rome at the time. It was like a really amazing city. Leonardo da Vinci had invented a rudimentary tank. In Germany, Martin Luther tries to reform the Roman Catholic Church and is excommunicated. While in Japan, the performance of no drama had reached the height of its popularity. The creation of Tenochtitlan demanded a skilled army of thousands of craftsmen. Yet how the Aztecs performed this formidable task of construction remains a mystery. For though the Aztecs used the wheel for their children's toys, they put it to no practical use. Without the wheel or beasts of burden, how could the Aztecs build on such a monumental scale? Experts theorize the answer lies in the ingenious concept of the city itself. Like Venice, Italy, Tenochtitlan was crisscrossed by an intricate network of canals. Could the Aztecs have used thousands of canoes to move the tons of materials needed for the city's construction? Yes. However Tenochtitlan was completed, the Spaniards were awed by this surprisingly modern city. 
when they got closer to the city and began to walk down the causeways, they were astounded at how clean the streets were in the city. In fact, refuse was uh, taken out of the city daily. They were astounded at the uh, reuse of everything. They, they were master ecologists. The way everything was so carefully painted and ornamented and, and how orderly Aztec life was. To precisely determine the exact days for planting and harvesting, the Aztecs established an accurate calendar, systematically charting the heavens. Aztec medicine was also highly sophisticated, with over 100 herbal remedies for specific ailments. As impressive as the Aztecs' scientific achievements, however, was their creative genius. These are the feather To an extraordinary degree, they viewed every aspect of life as an opportunity for creative expression. Aztec society is known for its militarism, its interest in human sacrifice, so that there's a tendency to look at all Aztec life as having been brutal. But in fact, there was an Aztec, a rich Aztec tradition of uh, poetry, of music, and of drama. Okay, and this hopefully is something that um, I've been able to express to you as well, that yes, there is this element of warfare and violence that's associated with um, Aztec culture, but it's also a very rich culture that's poetic, artistic, um, there are amazing sculptors, um, they're making music, they're, you know, master planners in terms of like how they laid out the city. The city is laid out on this grid um, and they uh, came up with this ingenious solution to the problem of not having enough land. Um, they uh, built chinampas, which sometimes are called floating gardens, but they're not really floating, they're artificial islands. Um, you can see in this illustration that posts or sticks are, are beaten into um, the bed of the lake. The lake is not that deep. It's maybe five or so feet deep in many places. Um, and then um, they tied these posts together and usually would plant trees along the edges. So when you see modern images of the chinampas, if you see a bunch of rows of stakes or trees, it's probably man-made. Um, and then they filled it in with dirt um, to really build an island to increase um, the surface area of the capital city in order to grow all the agriculture in order to feed the people um, of the city. Uh, it's, I, I'm not um, a scientist, but apparently it's like this really um, ingenious solution um, because not only does it expand the land space, but also because um, the lake bed, it's like they're built in the lake bed, um, nutrients and water um, from the lake bed go into the roots. So um, they're, it's like a really brilliant agricultural solution. Like they're able to have multiple harvests in one year. Um, so this is how they're able to feed the population. Um, it's some kind of like perfect root zone environment. Um, and so they don't need to water the plants and they don't need to like fertilize or put any kind of, you know, fertilizer in with the plants because they're getting all the nutrients from the bottom of the lake bed. Um, so this is a modern photograph um, of Xochimilco today. So you can see, um, can you see these like posts right here? Yeah. Are you still with me, anybody? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so sometimes I'm like, am I talking to nobody? Um, all these posts you can see. So this is a human made island. Um, and you can see that trees are usually planted along the edge as well. So this is basically like, you know, an island, an artificial island um, that was built in Lake Xochimilco. Um, nowadays, um, Lake Xochimilco is kind of like a tourist destination and a place for local people to go in their leisure time. So if you go today, you can rent a little boat like this, the Trajinera, um, and you can see that they're painted and decorated with these really elaborate designs. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. <laughs> Somebody's family is calling them. Um, 
And um, so like nowadays you can go and sort of visit and, you know, you rent the boat and you bring your friends and you get yeah, it. We turn up though. That's what we do. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You turn it up. You, yes. Um, so you go there and, you know, you, you drink some beer and you like have a fun Sunday. Um, and there are, you know, like mariachi bands that you can hire and there are people going by selling food and it becomes this kind of like entertainment thing. Um, but, you know, this is, this is what Xochimilco is now today. But if you go to visit this place, um, it gives you a, a little bit of a sense of like, you know, what Mexico City, this is what Mexico City would have looked like, you know, at the time of the arrival of the Spaniards. Like, you know, all of these waterways with these luscious, um, you know, trees and plants everywhere. Um, and then in downtown in the ceremonial center, these massive pyramids, everything stuccoed over, painted and decorated with beautiful sculptures and art. Um, so I wanna show you some more of that art um, in the last few minutes here. Um, so the capital city itself, the capital is established in 1325 and officially falls to the Spaniards in that year that I said I would make you memorize, which is 1521. This is when Tenochtitlan officially falls um, and becomes, you know, the capital of New Spain. Um, so this is what um, a modern photograph of the ruins of the Templo Mayor. The Templo Mayor, that temple with the two staircases and the two temples on top, would have been right here. Um, in the background, you can see the Metropolitan Cathedral of the city. So these are the ruins of the Templo Mayor. The Templo Mayor had several different uh, building stages. So there was the pyramid built, the two temples placed on top, and then another ruler came along and built another version of the pyramid. And another ruler came along and built another version of the pyramid. So that there are seven, diff seven different building stages of the Templo Mayor. So what you're seeing on the last level, this most exterior level, is what the Spaniards would have seen when they arrived, right? So two staircases. One um, temple on the top here dedicated to Tlaloc and the other temple dedicated to Huitzilopochtli. What you see inside down in here is the original temple. Um, and this is what you would see when you go to Mexico City today. You're seeing the original version. All of this other stuff is gone. Um, you'll also see flanking the Templo Mayor, the two temples dedicated to the Eagle Warriors and the Jaguar Warriors, the Eagle Warriors and the Jaguar Warriors. These are the two main branches of the military in um, the Aztec Empire. And you can see that um, religion militar and militarism are tied together. And they're both used to keep the people in power in power, right? You'll notice something at the foot of the staircase on the Huitzilopochtli side. This is a round disc, a large sculpture, a sculpture of our friend, Coil Schalke. And I will show you um, an image of that sculpture momentarily. So you can see at the base of the Huitzilopochtli side is this sculpture. Um, so it looks like this. It's this large, it's about nine or 10 feet across in diameter, so huge. And then all this empty space right here where these clouds are, like coming out of the ground right here would have been the pyramid. It's not there anymore because it was knocked down and the stones for the pyramid were used to build the colonial buildings around it. You'll see lots of snake imagery, imagery um, associated with um, militarism. So. Um, you know, the Eagle Warriors and the Jaguar Warriors, and you can see them depicted here um, in the Florentine Codex. Um, this is a photograph from the, the Templo Mayor. Um, to the left of the Templo Mayor is the Eagle Warrior um, Temple, and you can see carvings um, of warriors going off in procession, going off into battle. Um, you can see uh, temples, um, altars, all of the things that you would sort of expect um, to see uh, at an Aztec site. Um, you can see on the Tlaloc side, what's this? Do you recognize this? 
We saw it at Tula and at Chichen Itza. I forgot the name, but it's pretty much like, you know, where they sacrifice like animals, mm -hmm. sometimes people. And, Some, yeah. yeah, it's called the chalk mole. So this reclining figure is a chalk mole. This is on the, the Tlaloc side of the temple. Um, and in this little bowl, so this is like about life size. I don't, I don't know how long this sculpture is, three or four feet. Um, and right here in this little bowl, there would be offerings. Um, usually like a little bird, something like this. Sometimes there would be the practice of human sacrifice. Um, and then incense would be burned in here and, you know, if the prayers would go up into the heavens in the smoke. So this is the Tlaloc side of the temple. You can see traces of paint um, on um, the sculpture. Um, and then on the Huitzilopochtli side, you'll see at the bottom of the Huitzilopochtli side, the Koyoshalki stone, which is this large scale sculpture 10 feet across, depicting Koyo Shalki. So you can see her head um, with the bells on her cheeks. You can see her torso right here. Um, and you can see that her arms and legs um, are separated from her torso. You can see this kind of jagged edge and you can even see the bone sticking out. Can you see that? I love this little detail. Like a Aztec art is very abstract. So like in many ways, like the, the forms are simplified, but there are all these like delicious little details. Like I know it's gruesome, but the bone sticking out, I just love the bone sticking out. Um, you can also see that Quill Shonky is wearing a belt made out of snakes. Um, and then she has this pretty badass skull um, belt buckle. She also has, um, I don't know, I guess maybe jewelry, body jewelry. So you can see snakes um, tied around her legs as well. Um, and then she has these kind of like knee pads that are like skulls. Uh, and the um, sculpture itself would have originally been painted. So I think the one that I showed you earlier, um, you could see it wasn't, it's not the original sculpture, but um, it's more readable because it's painted. Um, so you can see how it sort of would have looked like originally. Um, it would be more readable. So you can see the torso, the legs, um, her head, and you can see that she's wearing jewelry and a headdress indicating her elite status. Um, so she is a main deity of the Aztec pantheon. Um, you'll also see in the sculpture that painted behind her is all of this red. Uh, and the blue might have been a little more greenish um, than this blue, but you know, there's some debate about the color. But anyway, this is placed at the bottom of the Huitzilopochtli side of the temple. So that means that the Templo Mayor um, functions as a sort of symbolic Coatepec snake mountain. Um, and the Coil Shalki stone, uh, like somebody's saying something, hold on, it's a detail of the bones that makes me feel almost pain, like damn, she's really chopped up. She really is chopped up. Yeah, so it's, this is one of the things that's so interesting about Aztec art is, even though it's like in many ways like simplified um, and abstracted, it's like there are these little details that really bring it to life. Um, and I'll show you one other thing um, before it's time to go um, in the um, Coatlicue sculpture as well. But anyway, this Coil Shanki stone is at the base of the Templo Mayor. So the Templo Mayor can function as uh, a symbolic Coatepec, symbolic Snake Mountain. And remember, Snake Mountain is where um, Huitzilopochtli like leaps out of the womb to fight his sister right? Um, so this is the top of the temple. And so sacrifices would be made and then bodies would be rolled down this staircase and they would land on top of this stone. And this stone would be like, you'd be looking down at it from on top of the temple. Um, and it, it would be in this painted disc, almost like a body in the middle of blood. Why? What is the purpose of this? In this case, you can see that art is used to intimidate people, to scare people. 
um, that people who um, would be watching this sacrifice, and of course they'd be sacrificing war captives. So they're going out, conquering a place, people are fighting back. When the Aztec would win, they would bring the war captives back and they would sacrifice people uh, to send a message. And all of us, we'd be here watching this um, and we would see this happen and we would see, you know, basically like a, a warning, like this is what will happen to you if you mess with us, if you mess with the Aztec empire, right? Um, if you try to fight us, um, this is what you're going, this is what you're going to see. This is what you're going to experience. Like, look at what Huitzilopochtli did to his own sister. He will not hesitate to do this to you, right? So this is really a message that is sent to the people to do not mess with the Aztec empire, right? Do not try to fight back. One other thing that I want to um, point out um, that I think is really amazing in terms of like Aztec art um, is the Coatlicue sculpture. So we looked at the sculpture earlier and you can see again, it's abstracted, it's like, you know, reduced to these kind of simple forms, but it's still really intricate. It's visually intricate and ornate. Um, and you can see, you can see um, the head, in the place of the head, this is like, I really love this, in the place of the head, if you look at it like, one way you can see two heads, like um, one and one snake in profile this way, and the other snake in profile this way, like two snakes looking at each other, right? And you can see the like these kind of fangs and like a little tongue hanging out and eye. But you can also look at it straight on as if it's like a frontal depiction of a snake. And then you can see two eyes and you can see a bifurcated tongue, which is what a snake's tongue looks like, right? So you can see that the artist has depicted like two images at once, right? Like two snakes in profile, but also like a, a head-on view of a snake. So this is again, one of these like really like ingenious details um, that's associated with Aztec art. Um, and I wanna end class today by telling you a really interesting story about the Coatlicue sculpture, um, this one in particular. Um, this one, you know, a lot of this art was like buried and like um, abandoned and knocked over and, you know, things built on top of this. Um, but in 1790, um, they, they found this sculpture again. Um, after it, you know, had been buried um, for like, you know, hundreds of years. They found the sculpture. Um, they took it out of the ground. They made some drawings of it. So what you're looking at on the screen are actually drawings um, from 1790 of the Coatlicue sculpture. And then because this sculpture was considered so frightening at the time, they reburied it in 1790. Um, and they didn't, you know, excavate it again until the 20th century. So the sculpture itself was reburied because people were too freaked out by it. Um, so I don't know. I just, I love that little um, anecdote. That's really funny. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Like they were, they were too, I mean, it's kind of a scary sculpture. It's kind of scary to look at. Like she looks, you know, pretty fierce. She's got a snake head and like human hearts and skull. I mean, yeah, but the effort put into having to rebury it. I know, right? <laughs> like this yeah. is too scary. You just gotta put that back. <laughs> yeah, it's a wild story. So there are lots of wild stories like this. Um, so, but I think we're running out of time, aren't we? Is it 2.10 already? It's 2.23. What? I'm, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry I keep talking. It's because I want to tell you all about these sculptures. Um, so I guess I'm going to go, but here's what I'm going to say. Um, I didn't get to finish, so I want you to go through and I want you to look at this. Um, and there's also a video that I want you to watch. Um, watch the video um, on the um, Sunstone, which you can also find on the Khan Academy website. Um, so, so keep looking through um, the PowerPoint, the slideshow, um, and, you know, look at these slides about the feather objects, 
um, and kind of the end of the empire. I'll, I'll do a little recap of it um, when we come back from spring, spring break, okay? Um, so this will be on YouTube um, tonight or tomorrow for anybody who didn't get to see it all. Um, make sure that you read this chapter on the Aztec Empire and on Aztec art um, and look through the slideshow um, at the stuff that I had to skip over. And enjoy your spring break and I'll see you in two weeks. Cool? Cool. Any cool. questions? Any questions? No? Okay. See you in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Stop recording. Okay.